yourselves and to all the flock over uh, the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now Paul is admonish, admonishing ministers in this sense, but we see a dynamic, the principle in the church. The minister is here to feed you. And that's where we get spiritually fed. And so it's important because if we think of this in the logical sense, if we want to grow and be healthy human beings, we can't do that if we never eat. The same is true spiritually. And that's why it's so important. Many of us won't go a day missing a meal. Who, how many of us are like, hey, today's a great day to fast. <laughs> in fact, I think I'm going to go on a week-long fast because who cares, right? We make it a point when we're driving out somewhere hey i'm hungry i'm gonna pull over and get something to eat when we're in our home you know if you're anything like me you go back to the fridge like a million times because you know you're hungry but you're too lazy to make anything for yourself thank god for good wives hallelujah you know before i had that good wife i didn't have as much of well anyway we take care of ourselves pretty good physically we work out, we, you know, do, we try to eat healthy, and some of us don't, but for the most part, we do, right? We don't intentionally eat things and say, boy, this is going to kill us. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but we do do that spiritually a lot. Oh, it's okay if I miss church. It's okay if I miss that meal. It's okay if I miss my morning prayer. It's okay if I'm not close to the family of God and those things. I feel the Holy Ghost here, and I don't mean to be offensive as I'm saying this, but when we put this in the context, really that's what we're doing. We're denying our soul spiritual food. Our soul will not prosper if we starve it. That's just the reality, and so it's important that we do come together. That we do maintain, and I'm talking about church in the sense far beyond just these us gathering together but personal devotion personal time of prayer reading the word of god teaching your family all of those things are things that feed our soul that help us to be healthy and strong spiritually if you are struggling in the church there is a problem with the supply of your spiritual food i'm glad i got i just got an amen from that because someone's playing the guitar <laughs> So the church is here to benefit you. It's okay, Amy. <laughs> is this the point where I make the disclaimer about uh, turning off your cell phones? No, I'm just teasing. I'm totally just teasing. You know, I've, I've had a lot of preachers get, you know, kind of on to people about stuff like that. Frankly, it's just the day and age that we live in, so I don't, it doesn't bug me. Turn them off, they don't yeah, that's exactly right. It's like trying to turn the alarm clock when you want to go back to sleep on the weekend because you forgot to turn it off. You know, can't get the darn you thing feel, on. Uh, church? Sometimes I miss church to go spend time with my mom down at the beach. A lot of times I try to make it whether like a, a Saturday or a Friday night, go down there and try to stay down there and see my mom and we'll fly back and go to church. Try not to mess it really with you know sometimes you know I'm, I'm trying to spend time with my mom more, especially with little real with me and stuff like that because I got to take care of her. But you know, you know what I'm saying. That's just right. so uh, it actually. Like, yeah, sometimes I think you're good to get. I'm trying to help her out. It ties it kind of into what we're saying. So the the way that prioritizes God, family, church. Yeah. However, it's all about balance. So the questions to ask yourself is, would I miss work to go help her? Am I going to miss work to go see her on a regular basis like that? Is work more important to me than being in the house of God? Is there a way that I can structure it? Now, sometimes there isn't. If, if you don't have a job and you need to uh, provide for your family and you got to work on Saturday or work on Thursday or whatever, then you need to do that. You need to provide for your family. But sometimes and i'm not saying this in your case so don't get me wrong but we just have to make a self check that we're not using things to excuse us from being in the house of god 
it, it, we can do it simply like this too. But well, I didn't make it to God, so I'll, I'll read a passage of scripture. Or I didn't make it to church, so I'll read a passage of scripture. So we want to feel good about our decision. If we're making those type of decisions in our mind, we probably need to try to make it to the house of God. And, um, you know, and that might be a problem that takes care of itself because he said she's moving in. So, you know, potentially that's something. But really that's a, uh, something that you got to work out with God, right? I, I will never be critical of anybody if they're going to go, you know, see their family or whatever. It, those things, think Mike hit it on, on the head. You don't get that time back. And so sometimes it is important. Easily. You know, and in fact, they made it very hard for me to go there because they said, you need to be here. This is what you need to be doing. And they wouldn't let me go. But I persisted, and I did go, and I kept my job there. And uh, if, if you don't go when she needs you, you won't get another chance. Because me and my mom didn't get along for a while. Because I'm not, I'm not going to lie. She wasn't really a good mom. I forgive her, and I'm really making connection with her. I believe a lot. I see her more, and, and, and coming up there, and stuff like that. You know, I'm, I'm kind of bringing advice to her too, because you know she's got a lot of negativity a lot of times about the world and people, and, and I'll kind of, you know, just kind of. Long time ago, I just like yeah, yeah whatever. You know, well, yeah, well. Now I'm like, you know, just just let it go, man. But and and you sometimes have to work those things out. There's no magic bullet or magic answer to something like that. Really, it's it's a self check with God because it's so easy for us to sometimes make excuses not to be and use things that are justifiable. And I'll go back to Mary and Martha. Mary was doing something that was good. She was preparing the meal for everybody there. It was important that they got fed. But what was more important is that Mary was able to spend time with Jesus. And there's things that we can do even when we're traveling. There's churches we may be able to potentially go to. There's devotions that we could be doing on those Sundays. So I don't want to uh, belabor that. And we can talk more about it after church. But um, anyway. We'll move on. Uh, so the church is here to benefit you. So not only is it all the other things that we just talked about tonight, but it really is to our benefit. It's not, uh, it shouldn't be a burden. And I hope nobody ever feels like coming to this church is a burden or going to anybody else's church for that manner is a burden. It should be something that we want to do because there are so many uh, rewards that we gain as a result of it. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has set in the church first apostles secondarily prophets thirdly teachers after that miracles then gifts of healing helps governments and diversities of tongues he gave the church these things for you he gave and i don't mean this pridefully but just very humbly in in, in the, the, the sense of scripture he gave me and my family for saint helens we are not here to lord over people I'm the pastor of this church. Sometimes that means there's some authority that need to be, needs to be taken, spiritually standards that need to be established for the church uh, in order to preserve the flock and maintain integrity in the work of God. But really what I am is I'm a servant. I am here to serve you and your families and help promote spiritual growth in your life and allow God to use me to help, uh, you know, tell what and proclaim the works of God and, the, and the, the things of God, the mindset of God to help you pray against spiritual wickedness and strongholds and all of those things. I'm here to serve you. I think a lot of times a lot of churches miss that and we become where we serve the ministry. Now, the ministry is worthy of double honor. It is. That's scriptural. We should respect and honor the man of God. But this is not my church so you guys can sit there and invest into me. This is a continually pouring out to you. And that's the way that the church is designed to be. Is that all of these things, all of these ministries, all of these gifts 
And in like kind, I'm part of the church as well. And some of you have some of these gifts and can also invest back to me because we're a body. We all work together. And uh, I'm going to get too far ahead of myself. There is strength in being part of an organization of churches also. And we see this in the Bible too. I am a UPCI minister. Now, I'm not saying that we're the only organization in the whole world that's going to heaven, but I do feel confident that we do have the right message, that we do hold the right standards, that we are doing what we need to do to make our way to heaven. And we are a fellowship of ministers. The strength of this, though, is this. The Colossians 4.16, And when this epistle is read among you, cause, it, cause that it also be read, be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. We see a strength in interconnecting of churches. Organization is not bad. In fact, it's the will of God that churches have a similar message. And that is why organizations are created because we all have a similar understanding of what the Bible says. Those things are good. I don't, uh, you know... We have a we live in a world of non-denominational. I'm non-denominational, and uh, that's a real positive thing. That is not a positive thing. The church should be the church. Truth should be the truth. It's really not the will of God that we preach a different message than maybe the church down the street, because we our Bible says the same thing. And a lot of people want to say, well, it's because of the interpretation of man. That's hogwash because most of those things are black and white in scripture. The Bible says you got to be baptized in Jesus name. It doesn't say it any other way. There is no debate there. The Bible says that there is one God. There is no debate there. The Bible says that we need to live holy because God is holy. There is no debate there. It says that you have to remove yourself from the things of the world. If any man have love for the things of the world, they have not the love of God. No debate. It's not up to interpretation. In fact, the Bible says that no scripture is of any private interpretation. <coughs> there are, um, I feel like hitting on this real quick. There are certain instances though where we fight different battles. There are different spirits that different churches fight. And so convictions may be different. Each church won't look exactly the same. The core message will be the same. The core doctrine will be the same. But sometimes we may set a standard to protect our children. For instance, if we had a problem with a lot of pedophiles, we may require two adults to supervise the children at all times, but the church down the street doesn't. I don't have scripture for that, but we do that because we understand that there may be a, a vulnerability in our specific church to that. It works the same way spiritually. And that's where a man of God comes in and you have to have trust. The man of God isn't doing it just so you can't have fun or to remove things. And, and I hope it never becomes you know, something where we don't have a law. We're not trying to make a law. But sometimes there are things that we're fighting and we hold a standard against those things. That makes sense. I won't get too much more deeper than that. But uh, I want you to understand having other churches, having Brother Brock's church in Beaverton that we can fellowship with and, and other churches around the organization. We just got done with youth convention where a whole bunch of churches get together. That is the will of God. That is beneficial. It's right. And it helps us to prosper. You shouldn't loathe going to church. You shouldn't sit there and say, man, tonight's Thursday night, man, tonight's Saturday, man, tonight's Sunday, and I got to get up, and I got to go to work tomorrow, and all of these things. And if that's ever the case, I, I take that personally, not in the sense of I'm offended at you, but this place should be a place where God moves, and you hear from the Lord, and some place where you're like, man, I just can't wait to go to church because I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Sometimes that's a ministry problem. We're not doing our job. And sometimes that's a saint problem because you've created an appetite for the world and so you no longer desire the things of God. So we all need to be humble in this pursuit. And the only thing I can do is the best that I can. The only thing you can do is the best that you can. But our resolve should be this. And if it's not, something's wrong. We need to figure out where the disconnect is in that system. Song of David says uh, this, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It seems so simple, but if I was to say, hey, we got church, we're going to have a special service on Sunday, we should have a, oh, great, we're going to have a special service on Sunday. Now, I'm not saying that 
we all feel like that all the time, and I'm not rebuking you if you, you know, feel tired or any of those things, but really it tells us what a heartbeat for God is. We get excited about something, and I hope it's about spiritual things, about the work of God. Matthew 16, 18 says this, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We talked about this. We talked about this war that you fight. And we talked about how we should be uh, advancing and on the move and not wait for the battle to come to us. But we take the battle to the enemy because we have the authority. We have God with us. God before us. Who can be against us? We're not in retreat. But it doesn't say as an individual we have the power against the gates of hell. But the church has the power against the gates of hell. I am not powerful individually as much as I am when we gather together. One puts a thousand to flight. Two puts ten thousand to flight. Biblically, each one of us being here uniting together in the spirit makes our prayer ten times, a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times more powerful than if we were to do it individually. And some of your greatest moves of God will happen in your greatest numbers because it's just like, I don't want to get all math geeky on you, but the power, when you power something to the fifth power, to the tenth power, you're, you're, you're multiplying it far beyond just basic two times two. Exponentially. Exponentially would be the word, yes. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> I knew you'd be with me on that. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, if you are connected to a church, the devil is going to try to disconnect you. We have a perfect example where he prayed for someone tonight. Because they're being disconnected from the church. Why? Because the church is part of our power source. And if you unplug from the church, and James, just to use your example... If we constantly find ourselves away from the church, we will be weaker as a result of that. Regardless of good intentions, regardless of, and, and certain circumstances may justify that. Someone's dying and you got to go across the country, you know. But there should still be a point where you find, you, you got to plug back in at some point. Maybe it's a midweek service instead of the Sunday service. Or maybe it's a personal devotion. Right, right. It's exactly right. And you know what? Family comes into town. In fact, we have a, someone who wants to stay for us for a short period of time during the summer. Guess what? They're coming to church. You want to stay at my house? You're going to church. What did I do after thinking about it? I went in and took a shower and bounced clean, good-looking clothes, which I had to dig all over. I even had to go out in the garage to find this in the backpack, you know, I mean, but, uh, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And, uh, you know, but what he's saying is you don't have to attend it on a regular basis. You just have to find ways to where you can attend church to where you don't lose that spiritual flood that you need. We're going to try to move on quickly here because I don't want to. I want to be sensitive to everybody's time. But if you're uh, if you are connected to a church, the devil is going to try to disconnect you. That's his first tactic when you're coming to God is to try to disconnect you. It's a Sunday here. It's a Thursday or a Saturday in our case. A Thursday here. It's uh, not doing your devotional on a regular basis. It's not reading your Bible. He's going to try to put a wedge in anywhere he can to stop the consistency of your spiritual growth and spiritual well-being. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. A lion seeks prey that it's all by itself. That's its ideal target to try to take down is one that's all by itself. They also try to take the weak because they are easily separated from the group. You have a bunch of strong uh, antelope or whatever it may be. They take off the weak one straggling behind. That's the target uh, for the lion. In either case, the lion's chances of killing the prey are increased if it can separate it from the group. And the same is true for each and every one of us. 
We don't have that, gate, that power that can come against the gates of hell if we disconnect from the church. And none of us are, the Bible says we're made a little lower than the angels. The devil may be having, have chains of darkness that he carries with him. He may be uh, been rebuked to a lower stature than what he was before, but he is still a spiritual being which has power. And he has more power than us. If we are not connected to the church and connected to God. So we need to be very cognizant of that. Very, very sensitive to that. I will make it a point to be in the house of God. And sometimes regardless of how I feel or what's going on in my life or any of those things. Has to become a priority to us. What I don't want is... You know, severe circumstances. I missed a funeral. I missed a wedding because I felt I need that. No, 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 no. Balance. We're talking about balance in this situation. But nonetheless, this should be a strong point in our life because we don't want to be separated from the group. In fact, sheep, the Bible calls us sheep. A lion, lions and uh, wolves and any other predator for that matter, when they come and attack, attack sheep, they don't always run, and if they do run, it's to regroup. And what they do is they form a tight barrier, and they put the weak in the middle, and the strongest stand in front. Now that lion, that bear, that wolf, whatever, sheep don't have a lot of ways to fight back. But they have strength in their numbers, and that predator will not attack them because it's not worth the risk. They break a leg, they die. Even if they take something else down in the process. And so that's the church. The strong are able to surround the weak. And we can stand up against the adversary. Moving on. Many times we feel like missing church is what we need. Uh, to deal with the situation. But as we just covered. You can't fight hell alone. You can't. We all want to be independent. We all want to be strong. But we are in this together. And we have to. To be together in order to win. By separating yourself, you are making yourself vulnerable to being hunted down and killed by the enemy of our souls. So it's important that we make church a priority. And when you don't feel like going to church, it's probably the time that you need to go to church the most. Now, if you have the flu, God bless you. Please stay at home. <laughs> Unless you really feel like God's telling you to go. I mean, we're open to anything. God's a healer. Um, you know, but, you know, use reason in some of these things. But if it's just because you weren't able to sleep in on Saturday because you decided to go sh uh, fishing at 4 o'clock in the morning and you're too tired to go to church on Sunday or, you know, whatever. I'm so used to having church on Sundays, so I always talk about church on Sundays. We have church on Saturdays. We keep the Sabbath. <laughs> um, but it, whatever it may be, you know, don't make it a priority. You would go to work. That's usually how I look at it. If I can be on time for work, I can be on time for church. If I can go to work and have a cold, I can go to church. That's how my parents raised me. If you want to go to your friend's house after school, then you better get your butt at school. Because <laughs> if you're too sick to go to school, you're too sick to go to your friend's house afterwards. And uh, I think we need to have that resolve with the church. I should have talked about this when we talked about God. Because we're going to talk about robbing God. But the church is the catalyst in which God has chosen for us to be able to give. So that's why I'm bringing it up now. I'm not going to spend long. In fact, the first offering we ever took up in this church was last, uh, last Saturday. I need to, giving is not, uh, receiving money is not my priority. And so a lot of times I just frankly forget because I just want to move of God. But I want to read some scriptures here because I'm doing a disservice to you if I don't tell you the importance of giving. So, uh, giving to, to the God. That's a pretty funny way to say that. Giving to God needs to be a priority. Malachi 3, 6 through 12. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the day of your fathers are ye gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. So he says, look, you messed up. Something's off. Basically what he says. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye say ye, wherein shall we return? 
So he says, you've left me. But the question is, where have, you, where have I left? They don't know. And so they ask the question, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? So we still don't understand in tithes and in offerings. Now here's, uh, and, and we'll continue to read a little bit more, but here's the cliff notes of this. When you don't, and I hope it's hard for a minister to get up here because I don't want you to feel like I'm in your pockets. I'm not. We're just reading scripture. This is what the word of God says. That's what I'm here to do. Proclaim the word of God. You're not robbing me and you're not robbing uh, the church when you don't give and tithe an offering. In fact, I'll even say it this way. You don't even have to give them to this church. Just give them. But you're robbing God. So I'm not offended by it. And the church isn't going to be offended by it. But God takes exception to it. And this is his word. But it's not just do this or else type of mentality. Let's, well, a little bit of it is. But let's talk about the benefits and we'll get there. So, ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So you're not just robbing God, but now he says you're robbing one another. You're robbing the city. You're robbing uh, the surrounding cities. That's a lot to bear. And he says you're cursed as a result of that. Now who wants to be blessed of God? I do. <laughs> I want him to pour it out. Scripturally, the easiest way for you to be blessed is to give. I want that to sink in because it's very true. Um, so you are cursed with the curse. You have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now where herein. Now we don't tempt God. I'm not going to get to the top of the tallest building in Portland, jump off, and say, God, you love me. You're going to save me. We don't tempt God. But he says in giving, prove me. He says, let me prove to you. Test me. Go ahead. Do what you know is good to do and see if I won't respond the way that I've said in the scripture. This is the only time that I know scripturally that God says, I dare you. <laughs> so he says, prove me. Um, doo -doo -doo. Meet in my house, prove me herewith. Saith the Lord of hosts. So again, this is God saying this. This isn't the priest. This isn't. A lot of times we look at the man of God and say, he just wants our money. And we got to get past that because this is God saying this. If I will not open the windows of heaven. So he talked about the bad stuff. But he says if you do this, I will open up the windows of heaven. That sounds pretty good. And pour you out a blessing that there shall not be enough room to receive it. That sounds like the type of blessing I want. <laughs> and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall, shall call you blessed, for you shall be uh, the delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now here's what he's saying. He says, I'm going to rebuke the devourer. I'm going to rebuke any spirit. I'm going to rebuke any devil. I'm going to rebuke anything that comes against what you're trying to do. What you put your hands to will be blessed because of you following this principle. If you're struggling financially. If you're struggling uh, uh, physically, emotionally. However, this is the easiest place sometimes for us to come to because we all understand giving. We all under, and you don't pay your tithes. You don't pay your offering. This isn't a bill. I'm not going to get done with the service and charge you all 50 bucks. You give. We have the opportunity to give because it all belongs to God. He lets us keep 90%. Seems pretty generous. But we want to be fleshly and we want to kind of turn that all around to be selfish and all of these things. And I can say this because I know my family has sacrificed to give. I sacrificed when I was single to give. And I don't want to say this pridefully. I'll just say it generally. God has taken care of me financially. More than my friends with college degrees. More than a lot of people who are older than me. 
God has opened up doors. He's taking care of it. In fact, it takes a lot of pressure off because when God says prove them, finances aren't coming in. I don't sit back there and worry upon my own talent. I just say, God, I've been doing what I've, you told me to do. So he takes care of it. He said you'll be blessed of all nations. I think I've, this is the last slide and one more. And we'll get through this in a hurry. So the power of the church. Acts 12, 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And guess what happens? The place shakes and an angel comes and releases uh, Peter out of the, the prison. And he's so disillusioned by it all, he thinks he's dreaming until he gets to the church. Because he knew people would be at the church praying. We have that strength. We can bind together. God can change situations as a result of that. Acts 2 47 praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved the church is the catalyst to save souls your family your friends those that you know need God you know they need God you know they're destroying their lives this is the power of the church this is the advantage of the church sometimes you know what they're going through but when you bring them to a place where I have no idea what they're going through and God speaks to them, they can't deny that. And our attitude toward the church should be to edify the church. Now here's the difference between a babe in Christ and someone who's mature in Christ. And sometimes we find ourselves <laughs> in both places at the same time. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Even so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Everything we, when we come into the house of God, it shouldn't be, God, I need you to take care of this problem, and God, I need you to handle that, and God, I need you to touch me, and God, I need this, and I need that, and I need, God is not your manservant. Really, our, our attitude should be, God, I want to bless you. I want to give you praise. And the result of that is he's going to do some great things in our life, we should be here to edify. We should think first to minister to others before we're thinking to minister to ourselves. Pray for others. Pray for other needs. So we do prayer before church. We take up the needs of others. Why? Because that's the way we want to be. We want to be edifying. So that should be our attitude in the church. Church shouldn't be our crutch. Shouldn't be what we lean on just to get us to the next week. It should help strengthen us so we can help carry the work of God. And the church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. Uh, and this is my last slide, I promise. If you didn't get anything, get this. I need your attention right now. Because this is so important. Because one of the enemy's tactics is to make you feel like it doesn't matter if you don't come. You're not there. It's one of the enemy's tactics. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above principalities and powers and might and dominion and everything that is named. I just want to emphasize this point. We talked about it already. Our problems become molehills compared to God. Why? Because it says he's far above. I love that. Devil, he is far above you. Problem, he's far above you. You better watch out. I might stop preaching. Hallelujah. And he hath uh, everything that is named, not only in this world, but the world which is to come. So he'll always be far above. And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. God is the head. We are his body. Now the question is we all understand that a body without an arm and without a leg oh, it disappeared. Uh, puts us at a disadvantage. We call this a handicap. Nobody wants to have a handicap. 